Okay, good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started right at, on time. And while we are introducing the speakers and our webinar today, please feel free to continue chatting in your name and your practice name just to introduce yourself to the rest of the group. And please feel free to share one heart-healthy food you enjoy in honor of National Nutrition Month. So my name is Rebecca Bally. I'm a Facilitation and Improvement Specialist at Oregon Healthcare Quality Corporation. And um, I am here to help moderate the webinar. My favorite heart-healthy food is having oatmeal for breakfast. I love it. I think it's simple and helps fill me up. So today, we are going to spend an hour, about an hour and a half, talking about developing successful manage, panel management processes, um, specifically to track care for patients with preventive and complex care needs. We'll hear from some experts and um, folks in the field about what they're doing and get some ideas for um, how you can develop or improve your panel management work in your own practice. A note about continuing education. We will be offering, um, through Health Insight New Mexico, 1.5 AMA PRA Category 1 credits. And in compliance um, with the ACCME NMMS standards for commercial support of CME, none of our speakers have um, any relevant financial relationships to disclose. If you would like to receive CME credit for today's activity, please chat in your name now. And also, um, at the end of the webinar, please do fill out the um, post-webinar evaluation survey, which includes questions um, about receiving your CME credit. Additionally, um, this activity has been granted for one continuing education unit, CEU, for um, nurses through Health Insight Nevada. And um, again, none of our um, presenters or planning committee have um, any relationships with industry or other conflicts of interest to disclose. If you would like to receive credit CEU um, for this activity, please again write in your chat in your name in the um, chat box and also fill out the survey at the end of the webinar to um, fill in all the relevant information. So um, I mentioned Health Insight. A few, minute, a few moments ago, and so I'd just like to give a brief introduction. Health Insight is the Quality Innovation Network Quality Improvement Organization, so Quinn QIO, that is serving Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, and Oregon through Acumentra Health. There are 14 Q Quinn QIOs that bring Medicare beneficiaries, providers, and communities together in data-driven initiatives that increase patient safety, make communities healthier, better coordinate post-hospital care, and improve clinical quality. The Quinn QIO work is grounded in principles aligning with the goals for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, or CMS, with their quality strategy to eliminate disparities, strengthen infrastructure and data system, enable innovation, and fostering learning organizations. Along with 13 other regional Quinn QIOs, Health Insight is leading healthcare quality improvement initiatives including the Million Hearts Initiative for the Medicare program for a five-year period from 2014 to 2019, as guided by the um, CMS. And this webinar is part of the Learning and Action Network, or LAN, efforts under the CMS project on the Cardiac Health Task, or Million Hearts. Throughout the presentation, we will be checking in with you so um, to see how we're doing and making sure that you're getting all the information that you need. So um, I'd like to quickly just review the technology. You've already seen some of it if you've been chatting in your introductions. To reduce feedback noise, everyone is and will remain on a global mute throughout the presentation. And we can unmute you if you would like to speak your question, um, but just raise your hand. It's a little icon there underneath the blue participants bar. We do have plenty of time set aside to address your questions. Many of you did submit questions upon registration, so thank you, and we have already tried to incorporate many of those into the presentation. But if you have additional questions or clarifying um, comments, please feel to type them into the chat box or the Q&A pane, and I will read your question. Um, I'll sort and read the questions for the presenters to answer. 
Please also feel free to see, send me, Rebecca Bally, or my colleague, Marissa Sweeney, any um, questions with technical issues you're having, and we will do our best to troubleshoot that. Any questions that we aren't able to address, we hope that you can be able to address with your, um, lead, your state lead or local project lead following the webinar. So with that, I will let the speakers introduce themselves. at and focus on and um, that my team and Rache will probably touch on this a little bit about really um, some of those things and how that works within the system and then again the piece that we look at monitoring tracking and following up um, how are we capturing and closing some of those gaps and really the follow-through on on those gaps um, so their service is really done in service to our health plan members and um, also our CCO incentive metrics um, so when we look at panel management, we really, a lot of you might be familiar with triple aim, but um, this kind of new piece here that we like to look at now is quadruple aim. It's really adding a piece to this. Um, we have um, increased patient satisfaction, increasing our clinical outcomes, decreasing our health care costs. And then that last one there now really that we're starting to look at as an industry is really staff satisfaction. You know, how happy are employees within this model um, within our organizations and the roles that they play on teams, really how satisfied are they within their role. Um, and so when we look at that, <coughs> sorry, um, when we look at so patient satisfaction and the way we do that through panel management is really the, are the needs of those patients being met? Are those gaps being closed? Are those patients being able to be identified and be and able to come in and meet and have their needs met. And a lot of that really comes to the interactions with the staff, the provider from the front to the back to the lab. Um, a lot of that is really how our staff interact um, and which definitely plays into the satisfaction of our patient. And then increasing our clinical outcomes. Um, are our patients getting in and getting those needed screenings done? Um, are the diabetics being managed like they should? Are, are they having the appropriate labs done? Um, and looking at decreasing our health care costs, we know that when our patients are followed and monitored and their gaps are being closed, they're getting the necessary screenings, we know overall that that is going to decrease our health care costs because they're getting those things done when they need to get them done. We're identifying those things of concern and we're able to hopefully follow it and track it and do something about it before it becomes a real problem. And just I'll touch briefly on the staff satisfaction part of that. Um, I'm very fortunate in working with our care organ panel coordinators. We call them panel coordinators. Um, a lot of you may call them panel managers. I'm, I'm very fortunate in working with this group and looking at the satisfaction they have at really working with our members um, and seeing and being able to see improvements in their health and being able to have those interactions with our members and following a patient through a process from the beginning to the end and playing a role within their health care, um, I, I know just from that has played a huge part in the satisfaction not only on my staff but also those that we work with because in, in health care and especially those that we serve, I mean, that's really our, our, our goal here is to, to help our patient get what they need and play a role in that in some way, shape or form. And we look at, when we look at an ideal skill set for panel managers, um, you guys may have um, these type of roles within your organizations, but traditionally this is really a, a role that is um, medical assistant background. Um, I've seen them in some organizations that have LPNs. I've even seen some nurses that have been in this type of role um, within certain organizations. And it's something kind of new that we're starting to see within this industry is community health workers and really the relationship that they have not only with the community but those members that are assigned to you or those, those patients that are coming to you and really the ties that they have to the community. 
Um, and the benefit of having somebody that knows those resources within your community, who knows the members on more of an intimate level because they see them outside of the healthcare setting, um, they interact with them in different ways outside of the healthcare setting. Um, another really skilled set of this is somebody that's bilingual, able to talk to your patients um, in their own language. Um, a lot of um, panel managers, I've seen that they have a, a bilingual background, they speak Spanish, English, we've even seen some in Russian and even some Asian languages that, that really communicate with those patients. Um, it's nice to have somebody that you can communicate to, somebody you're familiar with um, that shares a, a similar background in that language. Um, another um, skill we really look at is customer service and what I'd like to focus on is more of those soft skills. Um, it's something, well, we talk about, we talk a lot about, um, and when I talk about soft skills, I, I've heard somebody explain it to me really as somebody's emotional intelligence, um, the way they really interact with people, their adaptability, their flexibility, their, their problem solving, are they a team player, are they a critical thinker, um, how do they work under pressure, are they able to um, resolve conflict, and really their communication styles. And when we look at soft skills, that's really what we look at, is really how do they interact with the team and some of those skills that they bring to the team um, that would make them beneficial within this role. Um, some medical knowledge would be very helpful for somebody in this role. Um, maybe some medical terminology, um, maybe some anatomy and physiology, some basic healthcare knowledge, um, but not too much where they may get pulled. And what that's Something we see a lot within this role is those that are medical assistants and function as a panel manager within organizations, that it tends to be um, kind of a catch-all role um, if medical assistants are calling in or maybe that they have some front office experience if one of the front office staff is out, they get pulled to really help out and do other things other than panel management. Um, and so we see this happening a lot. And so really balancing that skill set of somebody that has some basic um, standard knowledge of medical knowledge and, and some of that skill, but also um, not too much where they can get pulled in different directions within the organization. Um, we look at uh, motivational interviewing. It's something that's kind of, you know, in the last 10 years, this is becoming something that a lot of organizations are looking into, really um, how to have conversations with patients, whether it's in a healthcare setting, over the phone. Um, how do you get them to commit to certain things? And this is something I think is important, especially in this role, when we're trying to get patients to come in and close some of their gaps. And sometimes um, our patients are not necessarily willing or want to come in and do that. And so helping them see the benefit in this and really um, talking to them in a way that um, can get them to commit to some things coming in and, and, and fulfilling some of those um, things that they need to get done. Um, somebody that's a multitasker, maybe some project management experience. And then that last one, definitely some EHR, um, data management, Excel. Um, depending on the role that you have this person in their panel management role within your organization, um, definitely having some good um, EHR experience or Excel knowledge, depending on how you have them tracking certain things, um, can be very useful and beneficial. Um, and so having, you know, the ideal skill set, we look at is the clinic really ready for this role? Um, and I'll just touch on a panel, and I know Marcel touched on this just a little bit. There's some really good webinars out there really about that talk about um, empanelment. Um, but really, when we look at empanelment, are your patients assigned to a provider? Is there a way that we can identify these patients and really what their needs are, what their gaps are? Um, and how do we go about doing this? Um, I know a lot of EHRs have a platform that they use um, to pull data from their EHR that can produce some of these lists, these gap lists for these people that are due for certain things, whether it's those that need an A1C or that have hypertension or those that need to come in for uh, a wellness check or, you know, for our kids if their immunizations are up to date. I mean, so there's ways we can pull this information from our EHR. Um, and so really working within your organization to figure out who that person is, who is it really the panel manager that understands that platform and they're able to go in and pull that work themselves? Or is this something, I know a lot of organizations have a quality improvement team and their QI team really does a lot of this for them. They can pull member lists, 
Um, so it kind of takes it out of the panel manager's hand so they can do more um, outreach, calling our members to get them in or figure out what their situation is or what is preventing them from closing some of these gaps. Um, another thing we look at is standing orders, policies and procedures, workflows and processes. And this can be really important when we start to look at this role um, and the type of background that this role um, plays within your organizations. And are they able to order labs within your EHR? Are they able um, to schedule outside imaging appointments? And, and that process of how that works, um, being able to identify those people whose role it is um, and, and how it's happening. And that last one there is really our roles defined. Um, we talk a lot about team-based care and working to the top of our license, but um, within organizations, really, is this the right person for um, doing this right role? Um, I know in some organizations that they've had nurses um, dedicated to calling patients and coming in and closing gaps. Um, is that the best use of an RN's time? Um, could this be done by somebody else? Um, could the front play a more proactive role in identifying some of these gaps? Um, can your receptionist, can, if uh, you have team coordinators, I mean, there's lots of different people that could play roles, um, this type of role. So I think this role really definitely needs some structure um, when we're looking at that because um, this can, like I said, they can get pulled in many different directions. So I think having some boundaries set around this position and really understanding who on the team is doing what, um, who's making follow-up calls, who's checking your in-baskets in your EHR, whose responsibility is it to call in refills, or whose responsibility is it to call the pharmacy. Um, and so, again, this can be a catch-all position, and so really understanding that and giving this, this position some structure um, to be able to make those calls and get those patients in and close those gaps and have those interactions with our, our your patients, our patients. Um, yeah, I think that's really all I have. Um, if you guys have questions, please uh, write them down. Uh, we'll have some time hopefully at the end to answer some of those. Okay, thank you, Scott. Yes, and if anybody is um, thinking of questions right now, please feel free to chat them in or put them into the Q&A section. Um, about anything between, about the difference between traditional versus non-traditional models. Um, one question that I have been getting throughout is whether or not the slides will, and the reporting will be made available. They will, they will be made available on the website after this webinar. And then also you can print the slides directly from WebEx by going to file, print, document, if you'd like to take notes as we go along. But otherwise, we, don't have any questions at this time. Um, again, we'll have other opportunities throughout the presentation, so please feel free to um, chat in questions. So, so Great, thanks, Rebecca. Um, we have two uh, speakers who are going to give us some um, insights from the field, and um, Marcy Silverstein from Physicians Medical Center is going to start us off talking about a traditional model. Um, and then Rache will take it and talk a little bit about a non-traditional model. Both speakers will kind of outline the who, what, when, how, and the lessons learned so that the um, audience, you guys, can kind of compare the two. So Marcy, I'll let you take it from here. And you know what, Marcy, I'll have um, the slides, so just tell me when to advance if I'm not getting it. Okay, hello. Um, so I'm Marcy from Physicians Medical Center, and we actually have a slightly different traditional model because we have um, high-level access database um, data pullers, and then we actually give the care management team the um, outreach par portion of the panel management. Um, so I actually specialize in our EHR. I, have a lot of knowledge because I was a medical assistant working in the office for eight years prior to becoming a panel manager. So I have a large amount of clinical experience. I did multiple jobs in, in the clinic. Um, so I do the chart audits because I know where everything's located in the chart. I manage the CCO member list, trying to make sure that those are kept up to date with um, any information that the CCO might not have um, because it was a uh, procedure done prior to um, the patient becoming a CCO member. Um, I also pull reports within our EHR system because we have um, a 
chart report um, uh, program inside of our EA chart, and then we also have the CQR system, which is the quality or clinical quality reporting system, which does our meaningful use in our um, ECQMs um, for the clinic. Our um, Zach Wynn is our access database specialist. He can actually pull um, special reports through Microsoft Access to get any data that we may not be able to get through the EHR reporting system or the CQR system. So he can do specialty diabetic reports for us, um, member roster lists for um, Providence, um, Regent Blue Cross, he also manages our roster for the CCO as well. Um, and he can pull data for um, special projects that the provider wants to actually be um, doing personally versus nationally needed or state needed. Um, the David, or Kevin Dow is um, our EMAR specialist, and he actually uses a custom-built panel, which is our EMARS, and um, it's a risk and out an assessment tool that will pull our impanelment, it will pull any high-risk patients for us, for which we um, rate from one to five, and then it will pull also our pain management um, program roster. If you want to um, change slides. Our EMARS is EMR Mining Analysis and Reporting System, and it pulls our panel sizes. It calculates our risk assessment um, for every patient in our clinic, and then we um, specifically reach out to our number five. Um, the data is ran quarterly. If we need it more often, we can pull it um, on a monthly basis. It's completely ran by um, Kevin and our care coordinators. Um, the team, the Kevin and our care management team does meet with the providers at least quarterly to review the fives, review our metric scorecard, and to review our um, diabetic patients that we can get from our specialty reporting system. So I'll go to the next slide. And then these are our scorecards that we give actually monthly to our providers. Um, they have meaningful use on the left and then our high-risk patient, just the number of high-risk patients that each provider has, the total diabetic patients, number of diabetic patients with an A1C over nine, uh, patients, diabetic patients with an LDL over 100, and then some of our metrics for the CCO, and then also our panel sizes. Um, we can see that they are done by individual providers and then also as a team because we do have team-based care in our clinic. Um, and then we also provide the um, CCO dashboard um, when we get those updated as well. We do work as a team, but we do have our individual um, areas that we specialize in. And then we all use Excel and get spreadsheets and get lists for providers so that we can they can go back to the teams and work on projects like um, hypertension, ASQ, uh, I believe there is a diabetic project going on right now. And so we're more of the data people that then are able to reach out to the teams to get those patients who need um, gaps in cares and and um, chronic care management taken care of. And so we have team coordinators to do um, the outreach. Any questions? I'm not sure if I need to go over anything else. <laughs> Hey, Marcy, can you just comment about the frequency in which they get the um, scorecards? Yeah, they get the scorecard monthly the, um, because we want to keep them up to date on everything that's going on and keep them um, condition, um, condin continuously um, man um, updating that data and, and keeping up with the diabetic patients and the five patients. So that's something that we do on a monthly basis um, just to keep that in the front of their minds. And then I know Emma's going to talk about inreach and outreach, but can you tell the audience in terms of your process for the panel, your team of panel managers, are they doing any inreach or outreach to the patients directly? Um, we do, um, I mark making flags, which is our kind of like a memo inside the patient's chart that um, if the patient's due for a carrying gap from the insurance or from our own research in our specific data, and then we also send 
Um, and that's where the provider sees it, and then they can um, contact the patient if, or they can talk to the patient at, at an appointment if they see that. We also do um, recall letters and gap care letters if they haven't been seen for a while or if they are having um, needing to come in on a regular basis. The, the provider will do a recall letter that said, a recall that says, you know, need to be seen in two months for a diabetic exam, and I will in two months make sure to send that patient a letter reminding them to come in if they haven't scheduled that appointment already. So we do both in-reach and outreach in that way. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you. Um, but we did have a question here, and you started talking a little bit about some of your procedures and processes, but the question is, what workflow changes have been instituted to enable these to be used in the clinic, or, um, or are they not used at the time of the visit? And I think the question is about the scorecard. Um, the scorecard, so the scorecard doesn't have patient-specific information on it, it but it, we do give lists of the patients who are, are um, fives and diabetics, and so the fives actually is in the banner, and if a patient who is a five, so they're higher risk, um, calls in or comes in, we will make sure that they get um, seen as soon as we can because we know that they may end up um, having some kind of failure or need to go to the ER if we aren't um, keeping up on their care. Um, so those are a little bit higher risk patients that we do um, tend to see more frequently, and we do, um, if they call in, we try to get them to see the provider, and that's in our banner so that anyone who who opened that chart will go, oh, that's a five, we need to take a little bit of special care because they do have the chronic care issues. Um, on the um, diabetics, we don't necessarily have um, anything that stands out to, for callers, but the providers do have their nursing staff who scrubs every day all their patients of the, of the next day, and they'll see, okay, the patient's diabetic, and they haven't done that, and they're on our list of over nine, so we need to make sure that patient gets an A1C while they're in the office tomorrow because we do have um, an A1C machine that we can, the nursing staff can use to get that A1C right then and there instead of going, oh, go to the lab, and having them just leave and not actually follow up with that lab that we need for that patient's health. That's great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, one, one other question was about, um, so, it says support staff have been trained, this is a follow-up to the last session, support staff have been trained to review the next day's patients and set up, just a clarification, I think, yes, you said that. Um, another question that came in was about, um, I think a lot of practices have different capabilities with some of this technology, and so maybe could you speak quickly to sort of your process before and after you had this EMR system in place or before you had this team? that has this protected time to um, look through some of the data? We actually had the, um, the EMARS has been there since the very beginning of our panel management team. Oh. We had a specialist um, build the, the EMARS and then the panel managers, that was kind of their first task is kind of making sure we cleaned up, up our empanelment and cleaned up our panel sizes and, and patients who hadn't been seen for a long time. And so that was a, our very first big project as panel management team. So it hasn't really changed because of that, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? I don't see any at this time, and um, but please, everyone, feel free to um, continue submitting them as they as you think of them. And if we continue on to the next section, we can always, and you think of something, we can always come back to it. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Thank you, Marcy. You're welcome. Marcel, go ahead and um, take it away. Marcel, are you still with us? Okay, so they just got disconnected quickly and they're calling back now, but um, 
Well, We're back. back. <laughs> we'll be back. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, Rebecca, we're doing great on time, correct? Yes, we're so great on time, and we just finished up uh, questions for Marcy, and um, awesome. we're ready to transition into the non the care Oregon non traditional model section. Lovely. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to um, hand it over to Rache Burns, who um, I mentioned earlier is on Scott Zalman's team with the panel coordinators. And um, just like Marcy, she's also going to talk about the who, what, when, and how, and any lessons learned. So go ahead, Rache. Well, thank you for the introduction. My name is Rache, and I'm one of the panel coordinators, and I do work with one of the organizations. Um, in our model, we have panel coordinators who are embedded into our healthcare organization. So we are not hired by the organization, but we are hired by the insurance. What we do is we are doing something similar to what we had talked about. We have the background of medical assistance, um, case management, some registration reps, and they're all familiar with healthcare in some way, shape, or form. And so because of our diverse backgrounds, we're able to help navigate the systems differently and understand the systems differently um, through our backgrounds and support each other in our organizations that we're working at, as well as support the organization that we're working on, um, the CCL metrics. So when we're looking at the patient's ASQ, um, when we're looking at the patient's adolescent well checks and Medicare measures like the diabetes metrics and things like that, we have an understanding of them. We're also doing it from a different point of view and trying to make sure that the patient's, meet, sorry, the patient's needs are met and that they also are um, being able to navigate the system for both their insurance needs and making sure that their services are covered, but as well as navigating the system from the healthcare organization side. So we have access to communication with the nurses, communication with the support staff and the providers so that we understand what it is that they're doing with the patient as well as understanding the initiative that we're going forward with with these metrics. So those are some of the things that we have as far as our qualities coming in as panel coordinators. Um, we're also liaisons for the patient. So it helps them feel, from my experience, what I notice is that patients feel a little bit better knowing that they're talking to their insurance before they go into these types of appointments or going into this type of healthcare model because they understand that this is something that is covered for them in their benefits. They understand what to expect when they come in from the office because we get that understanding from the organization. And then we're setting them up for a good transition into their healthcare. And then afterwards, they also have us as a resource if anything does happen or if they need to call and talk about something different, we're there, because we do have that medical experience, we're there as a liaison for them. And so I've noticed that that has been a great tool when it comes to those, this type of um, model. And so things that we've learned is collaboration is the best way to get them activated in their care. So when I'm saying that, it's collaborating with the office, collaborating so they understand where they're going, how much it's going to cost them, if it's going to cost them anything out of pocket, what to expect, if they're getting anything following up with the appointment, and different things like that. And then having that collaboration with the providers or with the medical staff and with the front desk staff that they know, oh, I've talked to this person already, and they have the knowledge that we are still there in the clinic. So for say, if a patient comes in, calls back to the clinic and says, I got a call from Care Oregon, then they know, oh yes, that's Roche. And then they can verify that this is legit. This is something that we are doing and we are working together to make sure that their health care is better. So the collaboration part has definitely helped um, patients more com become more comfortable in that situation. There's less errors on billing. So for us, when we're doing the outreach, these patients know that this is a covered benefit or what the covered amount is. When it's after the appointment, we are able to collaborate with the providers or with the medical staff to make sure that the correct codes are in, the correct billing information is in, so that there's less errors on the back end and less um, errors for the patient so they aren't receiving a bill that they shouldn't have received at the beginning. Um, faster fixes on the reimbursements and everything like that because we are working with the clinic to help them understand what codes need to be put in, what things need to be done to make sure that 
this trans this is a smooth transition when the patient is coming in and afterwards. And then it also helps the patient just feel better about their health care. And with that, we get more activated patients because the patient is going to be more activated when they feel and when they know that everybody is working together to make sure that they are taken care of or that their health care is important to not only just them, but to us as well. Are there any questions? Thank you, Roche. I think that, that was um, a great explanation of how it can be done um, in a sort of different way. I like this non-traditional model, particularly because we had a couple of questions come in about um, how do we even make this a reality? How do we do panel management when we are a two-provider office or when we don't necessarily have the um, capacity or the ability to pay for some of this technology? And, and I'm wondering if that's um, sort of the benefit of having the insurance provider provide some of this panel management. I can speak to that a little bit, and I'll go, this is Scott again, so I'll go back to really defining roles within your organization. Um, and there's a lot of data that's available um, to practitioners, providers, um, healthcare staff, and in their settings. So um, for those that have those questions, I would encourage you to work with some of your payers to see what kind of data they can get you. Um, I know from where we sit at Care Oregon, we provide our network with a lot of information regarding our members and really some of the gaps that they're due for, um, some of the things that they need to come in and get done. And then also for some of those smaller practices, I know um, really looking at focusing on some of the, you know, one or two of those things that we feel like can make a really big impact or benefit our patients. Um, and then look at really the roles within your clinics and see who could do this. Is it really more of an upskilling for the front desk, um, for your receptionist who maybe can identify some of these gaps when the patients are checking in? And documenting some of this, is it the medical assistant looking at the schedule the day before or the day of? Um, is it what, during the rooming process? What are a couple of things that they could be looked for um, as far as identifying some of these gaps or closing some of these gaps and really the follow through? Um, um, that's what I would have to say. Really, I mean, a lot of it has to do with role definition and really what data is available to you. Um, so I would encourage you, again, really work with your payers to see what kind of data they can get or what they would be willing to give to you um, as, you know, we really move into this transparency model of, you know, these are our members. We really deserve to know what's going on with them, you know, and maybe explain some of the limitations that you have as a smaller practice and see where that they can supplement some of that information to you. Thank you, Scott. I think that's that's really helpful for people to keep in mind. And um, I think having we have some some of those resources cited in the at the end of the presentation for people to to um, look at and take a look at after the presentation. Another question that came in was sort of about um, patients with complex health needs. So patients who have multiple chronic diseases and whether or not um, is is I guess the question is. Is panel management really just for those patients, or should it be utilized for all patients or any patients who, who just need a little extra support? So, hi, this is Emma Abelis. Um, so, maybe I can speak to that just a little bit. Um, in my experience with panel management, um, being a panel manager previously, and um, working with clinics who are implementing panel management, that comes up a lot. Um, so we obviously have patients with multiple chronic conditions who um, who qualify for panel management. Um, panel management in terms of population health is for everybody in your clinic. All your patients um, need some sort of panel management, whether it's just to get an immunization each year um, or whether they um, pop up on multiple uh, registries that you're um, polling. So if you have a diabetic patient who also has asthma, who also has COPD, um, they're going to be on multiple registries. And if your um, organization has highlighted those, um, you know, specific diseases as ones that you're tracking, um, it then becomes kind of this um, decision in the organization, is this patient really um, meant for the panel management type of um, 
care, or do they then go on to a registry of a um, RN case manager in which they'd be um, monitored at maybe a, a different level of care? And so that's kind of an organizational um, decision, and I've definitely seen um, it done both ways where a panel manager um, monitors the list but then um, coordinates with an RN and says, hey, I'm outreaching for this diabetic patient because they're due for an A1C. I also noticed they're on our asthma and COPD registry. Um, let's maybe have a conversation before I call this patient and so we can coordinate uh, the care so that the patient's not getting multiple calls. Um, maybe coming in for superfluous visits, um, that sort of thing, or they just go on a case management um, panel of an RN. Um, so I, I've seen it done a few different ways, and and really, if you're if you're interested in more of that um, chronic care case management, that might be something that one of our another webinar might be able to touch on a little bit more than what we'll get to today. Mm -hmm. We also have our contact names at the end of the um, slide deck, and we'd be happy to answer individual questions if they're emailed to us, too. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Emma, for, um, for explaining all of that. And we just have one more question. Um, how, is the patient, how is informed consent of the patient factored into data sharing um, for panel management? Wow, good question. So I know here in the state of Oregon we have some pretty strict age definitions as far as what a patient is able to consent for, what they're not able to consent for, the type of visit. Um, so it might vary by state, and so I guess my answer to that would be I would encourage you to look at really what your state's laws say about informed consent um, as far as what age uh, a patient can come in and get certain services. Um, from where we sit, we always try to include the parents as much as possible. I know in some of our EHRs you're able to identify some confidential stuff and some patients that um, don't want their parents informed on certain things, and, and some of that does, again, apply to their age. So I guess, I guess I would encourage you to look at really within your organization, you should have some standards around outreaching to those members and really what they're due for, if it's for an adolescent well visit or if it's an immunization only or if it's a, a woman's health issue, that really understanding those before you make those outreach calls. I'm wondering, and I'm seeing on the chat, this is from Penelope Perryman, is your question more regarding data sharing between a clinic and a um, insurance company or was uh, it more about an age of consent for the different outreach? Good question, yeah. Rebecca, I don't think Penna, she can't talk directly. I think she's muted, so maybe okay. she can chat we can un Yeah, we can unmute her. But also, um, while I'm doing that, just want to remind folks that um, if you are participating with um, Health Insight in any one of their tasks, I would encourage you to reach out to your state lead uh, for state-specific questions about some of the um, rules and regulations. So. And then Penelope, you're unmuted now if you'd like to explain a little bit more about your question. Oh, I just typed in a clarification. I don't oh, mean eight. Okay, thank yeah. you, Penelope. So not so not the age of consent, but more, oh, I see it. So um, registries if we're dealing with HIV status or um, behavioral health diagnosis, okay. Um, so I personally have not dealt with um, like a registry that a panel manager would um, be really discussing more of HIV status. Um, behavioral health definitely comes up um, when we um, speak to patients who we outreach to who also have behavioral health issues. Um, I've seen clinics who have some integrated um, behaviorists in the clinic be a part of a care team in which that panel manager might um, look at the chart before they outreach to the patient and say, oh, you know, it looks like our behaviorist has been involved in this um, person's care. 
um, because of these issues, and they may discuss the patient with the behaviorist before they make the call, and so that they're more informed about maybe the best way to engage that patient um, for a metric like, you know, get, coming in for a, a well check or something like that. Um, and if it's, I and I don't think that panel management um, necessarily um, should be engaging patients around their behavioral health issues. So we wouldn't necessarily run a re registry off of um, a, di a, a behavioral health diagnosis um, and then be reaching out to them via a panel manager. Um, so it, that would maybe be be a behaviorist or the provider if you don't have a behaviorist in the clinic. Um, but but being aware of those behavioral health issues is definitely a, a part of it. Um, and and I would just say the team based care really speaks to that in that you you got to be um, cognizant of everything in the patient's chart before you go outreaching to them. So sorry I don't have a. Uh, a better um, answer to that question, uh, Penelope. So this is Roche. Um, as a panel coordinator, I don't, I'm not involved in any of that diagnosis. The most that I would be doing is identifying the need. So similar to like the craft or the PHQ that are being done in the clinics, I would be identifying that for the patients. I wouldn't be looking for those diagnoses. It's just more, this is the need. We need to talk, discuss this. So it's more preventative health care than it is actually looking for those diagnoses. This is Scott again. I will touch briefly. So you did bring up HIV. I know um, in those type of situations, those patients are usually um, seeing a particular provider. And I have seen some models where they have within those types of um, settings that they do do some panel management specifically to the diagnosis. Um, but it's usually an MA doing outreach within those settings um, to the panel of HIV patients that are assigned to that provider, um, and they manage it as a care team. So I, I have seen some stuff like that, um, and again, with the behavioral health stuff, I'll just, I'll just ditto what Emma said. Um, and again, the state, so here in Oregon, we have an all payers, all claims system that we can get a lot of this data from. And if this is something you really want to know or you really have an interest in, I would, I would encourage you to contact the state to see um, what kind of registries they can give you or information that they can give you regarding your patients um, and maybe some of those diagnoses. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, Rebecca, you get any more questions before we move on to Emma? No, we're not. And sorry, I was just about to move over to Emma, and it looks like a few people are um, getting antsy to, to play around on the slides and stuff, but just to let everyone know that everyone has all, all privileges, so any edits you do, we can see. <laughs> Great. <laughs> right, we'll like we'll transition over to Emma. Yeah. <laughs> it's decorative. Uh, it makes my slides a little bit more interesting. Um, so, hi, uh, again, this is Emma Abelis. I'm a primary care innovation specialist here at Care Oregon. Um, and what I do is I, um, I work with clinics and I, I coach them on um, improvement in their healthcare delivery system. Um, and a lot of times I work with clinics on panel management. It's kind of a hot topic and something that people are really anxious to dive into. Um, and so, and again, um, my background, I, I was a panel manager at a clinic prior to coming to Care Oregon. Um, and so I've done this um, in a more of a traditional model, like um, Scott and talked about earlier and Marcy talked about. Um, so in a primary care clinic, um, scrubbing charts and, and what I, on this slide, I talk about in reach and that's um, the scrubbing. I, I kind of use that interchangeably. Um, so scrubbing charts, looking for gaps in care and outreach into those patients. Um, or the inreach would be if they are coming in to the clinic for a visit. Um, so anyway, so when I work with clinics, um, we kind of make this definition um, concrete so we know what we're talking about. Um, and so uh, talking about outreach, so um, obviously it's connecting with patients via phone, letter, or your health portal if you have one um, for the purpose of closing gaps in care. Um, and engaging with patients who may not regularly be seen at the clinic or that they are regularly seen um, based on your outreach. Um, a lot of outreach that I did personally, um, you know, patients really depended on that phone call every six months to get them in for their um, diabetic care. 
um, they, they liked that contact with their team. Um, and in reach really, um, in reach or scrubbing is the auditing of charts of patients on the schedule. So they've already made their appointment to come in um, for the same purpose of closing gaps in care um, in order to huddle with the team and prepare for the visit. Um, so I did a lot of this um, in my role as a panel manager, um, scrubbing charts for the next day, um, identifying those gaps in care um, for all the patients coming in the next day and um, identifying those with the provider and MA um, so that they can create a plan um, for that patient's visit and um, close any gaps that they can in that visit. Um, Hold on. Um, hang on real quick, we're gonna. There you go. All right, there we go. Um, and so working with a, a clinic system recently, um, who really was preparing for this transition to panel management. Um, we, we've kind of gone through this um, long-term transition with them. Um, and, there, and so if you're a clinic who has not started panel management, um, what, I'm, what I would uh, tell you is in preparation for panel management, something that I think is really key, and I think Scott talked a little bit about it earlier, is team-based care. So. Um, a, a model for this would be something like one or two provider um, FTE um, with an MA per provider or in a smaller system maybe you have one MA for two providers um, and this panel manager in a team, maybe there's an RN on a team and that panel manager would be responsible for the panel of patients for both providers. So the, we talk about teams, some clinics call them pods. And so um, team-based care, um, you know, we've, we've got lots of um, peer-reviewed articles about team-based care um, that really support the model, um, and it, it's a great place to start. So the clinic that I most recently have uh, coached um, started team-based care in October. They went live on October 5th with this new model of care, and, um, and it's been an adjustment and um, I will let you know for clinics who are looking to do this. So they went live for team-based care in October and it is now March and we are just starting their panel management training. So it's a process. It's not quick. Um, there's a lot of things to consider and um, one of those things is the roles and responsibilities. So you have a team and newly formed teams, everyone's a little unsure of their roles. You have providers who may have been feeling responsible for their entire panel of patients and all of the measures, metrics, or chronic diseases that um, a panel manager may start to address. Um, and so really providing clarity for all the roles on the team and this panel manager and what they're going to do. Um, for implementation for panel management, um, it's really right now what we're um, struggling with is what reports to generate and how to generate those reports, so where you're getting them. Um, I know we have callers on the line um, from different states, different um, electronic health records or not electronic health records. Maybe people are still doing paper charts. So this is something to consider when you are trying to implement panel management is where are you going to get the list? of patients, how are you going to stratify them, are you going to, um, I was interested to hear Marcy talk about their uh, EMARs for stratifying patients based on a one to five level of acuity, that's, that's pretty uh, high level stuff there, I, that's really exciting. Um, but really starting out basic, um, I like to talk to clinics about reporting a diabetic registry first. Um, that, that seems to be um, an important um, disease to monitor in a clinic. A lot of people are, um, ha know their diabetic patients because of the frequency of having to see them, and um, it's just a good place to start. You can also start if you have um, priority metrics in your clinic um, with just one or two that you'll pull a registry of. So, Navigating your system, where you're going to pull the reports, how those reports are going to get pulled, and really playing around with the reports to make sure that they're accurate. Um, 
and like I said, choosing priorities to track. So you're going to need leadership on this um, to decide what our panel manager is going to be um, doing their outreach based on. Are you going to track diabetes? Are you going to track your um, well child checks, your developmental screenings, um, things like that. And then um, communicating to providers to get buy-in because it is a, a change in um, traditional model of care where a provider is responsible for all of their patients' needs. Um, moving to team-based care, um, you know, it divides up the responsibility amongst the team members, but that's not an easy thing to do for a lot of people. It takes trust in your team. Um, change is hard for a lot of people. Um, and developing trust amongst the people in your team to um, really um, follow guidelines. You know, um, a provider needs to know that everyone on the team understands um, a diabetic patient's needs and that they're going to provide safe care for them. Um, no. So, in this um, model that I'm doing with this clinic, um, so right now we're doing a training on the panel management. We have decided on registries, um, and in this particular EHR is Ocean, it's a product of Epic, and we're using Reporting Workbench. We um, we tried it out. We've uh, decided on what uh, list to run and how we're going to do that and what parameters are going to be established. But that registry needs to be kept up to date. Um, there's, all, there's all kinds of changes that happen in an EHR, um, making sure that you're catching all the diabetic patients, um, just using that as an example again. Um, so someone needs to be responsible for keeping that up to date. Um, the panel managers um, are responsible in this clinic setting for running those registries, but they do have a quality team um, and an EPIC uh, user team to back them up. Um, and so that'll be a part of their sustainability plan is making sure that the lists that they run are accurate and are giving them what they need. Um, so clinical practice guidelines, so we know that um, guidelines change, um, you know, for PAPs, for mammogram, colorectal cancer screening, those things change, and um, making sure that you are uh, training your staff, your panel managers, to understand those guidelines so that they're not calling blindly to patients who may have questions about why do I need a mammogram every two years? Why do I need colorectal cancer screening every year for this, but every 10 years for a colonoscopy? Things like that, um, making sure everyone's up to date on those. Um, consistent meeting agenda and problem solving. So when, um, when I was doing panel management myself, um, and we had four teams, four different panel managers, um, we would get together frequently, so I would say probably once every two weeks, um, to really talk about the, the issues that came up in the outreach process. Um, and it wasn't so much on our supervisor, but really the team of panel managers ourselves to do the problem solving. Um, we escalated issues as needed, um, but we really were the people to decide, hey, you know what, I've been, um, I've been scrubbing for this and I can't find it in the chart. Um, how are you doing this? Or I've been outreaching for this and has this ever come up for you guys? And so having the team of panel managers, or if maybe there's only one panel manager in your clinic, if you're a small clinic, um, giving them an outlet to um, meet frequently with someone who can help them um, problem solve these issues. That was, that was something that was really important to me as a panel manager. Um, sustainability um, with policies and procedures, um, I, I uh, definitely recommend having everything on a shared space, um, the guidelines that you guys create for panel management. Um, so we have kind of the typical outreach model is um, run your registry report, um, outreach to a specific group of patients two calls and a letter if, if you can't reach them. Um, 
and put it in a policy. I mean, that's a very basic policy, but put it in a policy, write up your workflows, maybe use a Visio for workflows, um, but um, go to them frequently, you know, every couple months and make sure that they're up to date so that when you get new staff on board, you can train them correctly. Um, if people in those frequent meetings have come up with better um, ways to do it, that you can update those policies. And this is how panel management is sustained and not um, something that um, just fizzles. Um, and then staff competencies. Um, I think it's always important to make sure that your um, staff um, really know what they're doing, know um, the basics of um, the screenings and outreach and um, that they are communicating with patients in a way that engages the patient and also educates them a little bit, um, making sure that they can do the job. Sorry. So, um, in the scenario here with the clinic I've been working with, um, some lessons learned. So, they, they had new teams rolled out in October, um, and one of their big things was they wanted panel managers who were CMAs, um, and most of the panel managers that um, they have now were CMAs in the clinic. Um, previously, and they they hired additional staff when they did this, but moved CMAs from the floor to the panel management position. And they wanted this for various reasons, um, mostly the knowledge of a CMA to do the outreach and talk, talk to the patients in a way that communicates the need for patients to come in for these different things. Um, it, great, the CMA role really is a, um, a great knowledge background to base off of. Um, but Scott talked about it a little bit earlier. The big thing that they are having issue with now is protecting their time. So they have a job to do and panel management doesn't sustain itself and it doesn't it's not successful unless they continuously do the job. Um, and right now what's happening is on the floor someone calls out sick, well the panel manager used to be that provider CMA is sitting right there in the pod. And it's very tempting to pull that person to work the floor. So it, it was kind of a blessing and a curse at the same time. You've got um, someone who knows that patient probably very well um, to do outreach for, but they also know this other job. So I, I really, I recommend when people are starting a panel management program to really think about that as a barrier um, to getting panel management done. Um, what, how are you going to protect their time? How are you going to make the team see this person as this new role? Um, will you hire someone who maybe has the CMA background? Um, but wasn't a CMA at your clinic. Maybe that's something that you would do instead. Um, I myself never had, was never a CMA. I had medical background as far as medical terminology and I've worked in clinics before, but my role in a clinic prior to panel management was front desk. Um, so everything I learned, I learned kind of on the job, in the team, just being around people and um, just asking questions about disease about the patients and things like that. So it can be taught. Um, if, you, if you prefer not to, to take your CMA off the floor to do panel management, um, you know, you can do this in a model of um, maybe a front desk person. Um, let's see this question. Is a uh, recommended team size. How many providers for panel manager? Rebecca, we just have a quick question here about team size, so we can maybe address it right now. Yeah. Sure. Or do you want to wait? Okay. So the question is, yeah, so the question is, what is the recommended team size? How many providers for panel management, assistant, RN? Each of our providers have an MA, one. I think it's supposed to be CMA. CMA um, for five. Oh, panel management. One panel oh, manager for five teams. For five teams currently, one RN for four providers. So um, let's see. 
currently at the clinic that I'm coaching right now, they have two to three FTE providers, one RN, one health team assistant, which is a clerical role in which they are using that role to do referrals, vaccines, phone calls, um, some refills. Um, and then they have they have one CMA per provider, um, and then they have the panel manager for the two to three FTE provider. And so, um, I, I definitely the model is working. Um, the clinic that I worked at was a um, teaching hospital, and so they had about five to six providers, not five to six FTE. There was um, various FTE on that team with one RN one um, the panel manager and a one-to-one -one MA ratio. Um, I would say, kind of gets into panel sizes too. Um, let's see. We have several questions so we can move okay. to Q&A whenever you like. Um, okay, so so I, I would, I mean, ideally probably like three three providers per panel manager, you know, three, it can be done if you have full -time some full-time providers, sorry. Um, it can be done um, more, um, but it depends on the other responsibility of that panel manager. Is that panel manager also taking care of um, admin things like vaccine and phone calls and, and things like that? Um, so it kind of varies, but three would probably be my ideal. Rebecca, we, we also want to hear maybe just from Scott in terms of um, the, and or Bache in terms of their workload. And then I, I'm kind of curious to hear from Marcy too, just so that we have some real examples in the field. That sounds great. I'll unmute her. So this is Scott. Um, when we were looking at our model, our non-traditional model of panel management, we used a, about a rough 5,000 patient per clinic. So those um, that we know members of care, care organ members that were assigned to a particular clinic. So those clinics that have 5,000 or more members, we use that as kind of our guide to where we would like to place one of our panel coordinators. So it's really around 5,000 patients or members per panel coordinator. Okay. Marcy, are you unmuted? Yeah, I am, I think. Awesome. <laughs> I. <laughs> We actually have three for the whole clinic. We don't actually have it per like five providers. We run clinic-wide data. Um, and how many and providers do you have in your office? We have uh, 14 full-time and then uh, about five um, at varying levels of part-time. Okay. Great. And then That's I actually do stuff other than panel management as well. Do they all, or is that just you, Marcy? Uh, just me. Just you, okay. Right. Um, are there other questions regarding that? Um, I just had two other things to talk about. I'll go ahead and talk about that, and then and then we'll get back to questions. So um, I, I would say another lesson learned was rolling out multiple new roles at the same time if you're also doing something else um, in addition to starting a panel management program, um, I mentioned the health team assistant on this um, in this scenario was also a new role for them. And because panel management had never been done at the clinic and the role of the health team assistant was to do referrals, which was ongoing and needed to stay ongoing, the priority was to keep the health team assistant role up and running, and um, the panel managers ended up supporting that role for now about five months while the health team assistants really got to know their responsibilities. And so um, I, would, I would hesitate to do that again just because um, we, we have, you know, it, it's just taken a long time to get the panel management um, program up and running. Um, and so, and then the other thing is the training timeline, making sure that um, you really do a lot of the prep work before you put a panel manager into their role because they may be supporting other roles or doing random things um, while you're trying to come up with a training, which can be a, a big task that we're currently doing now. So, um, 
Okay. So I want to make sure that we have time for more questions. I, I'm not sure if uh, people had more. I, I don't see any on the chat screen, but. There is one about how many patients approximately in each panel. Oh, in each panel? Or um, per, per one FTE provider, maybe. Okay. so. It really varies in the clinic, and that's that's a lot to do with um, your impanelment, um, which we spoke a little bit about earlier. And there's it's a whole uh, webinar in and of itself, and how you calculate your ideal panel size for a 1.0 FTE provider who sees, let's say, 22 patients in a um, clinic day. Um, you know, I've seen 12, 1,300 patients on their panel, and that's active patients. So um, a patient is defined as an active patient if they've been seen in the clinic in the last 18 months. Um, and then if you multiply that by three uh, providers, so you know, 3,600 patients um, per panel manager. But again, Scott just said that his panel coordinators have approximately 5,000 patients that they're um, responsible for. Um, so it really kind of depends on how you are you are defining your impanelment process and your ideal panel sizes. But hopefully that kind of gives you an idea. Great. Um, Rebecca, we're seeing your, do you want to take it from here in terms of the questions? Sure, I'm happy to. A couple of people have chatted me privately some questions. And, uh -huh. um, and so while, while we're talking to you these, I just want people to be thinking too about the learning objectives and anything that you need clarification to make sure that you um, have fully met all of the learning objectives that we stated, please feel free to add them. So we had a couple of questions about panel sizes and recommendations or references, and I think we've covered that. Um, one question was, how do you coordinate members' appearance on lists such that members don't receive multiple calls for individual care gaps? I think mm -hmm. we touched on this a little bit earlier, but I think this is going to make a little more specificity. So this is Roche, and um, for me, my lists come from Care Oregon, and our lists include everything. So we can look and see if the member is due for diabetes and due for CRC all on one list. We can filter out our list based on that. Um, <clears throat> for pediatrics, we can see if they're due for immunizations and ASQs and those things. So we can see if one patient is targeted for multiple things on the list that are generated for me as a panel coordinator. For the clinic, um, what I've noticed is that they don't either if not have the ability, they haven't got the capability yet to put multiple members on list. So you see a lot more of um, like an embedded person that's hired by an organization looking at multiple lists rather than us who are able to see multiple things on one list. So it does, for me, it's a lot less chart review for somebody who is working with an organization specifically. And this is just also coming from past experience of doing this work with an organization, being hired by the organization. I'm looking at multiple lists rather than looking at just one that can tell me the whole pretty much synopsis for the patient. Yeah, and I can also say um, it's something that this clinic that I'm working with um, is also concerned about. Um, and in their EHR, there is a functionality if you have created patient lists to add a column that says what other lists they belong on as well. So if I'm looking at my diabetic patients with diabetes list, I can um, look at a column that says they are also on a list for these other chronic disease um, chronic disease registries. Um, however, in doing this myself, um, there, the process of scrubbing or in reach was key to um, doing having a, the full picture of a patient when I was doing the outreach. Um, it, it did take a, you know, some chart auditing to say, okay, I'm looking at all of their health maintenance items, and before I call this patient, this patient because they're on my one list, I'm going to make sure that I look at all of their care gaps. So, depending on the EHR and the capabilities that you have at your clinic, it could be that you have to do some pretty in-depth chart auditing um, as a panel manager to really get that full picture. Um, or you could, if you're 
clinic has the functionality to um, run different reports at the same time and cross-reference. Um, I mean, that's obviously really beneficial to you. Um, but yeah, it, it could be kind of um, in-depth chart auditing that you end up doing so that you don't um, make multiple calls to the same patient for different things. Thank you. I, th I think that um, answered that person's question. We also had a few questions about more training or additional resources, and um, specifically with regard to panel management. One person um, says their, their office is using EPIC, and so they would like more training um, and ideas for how to better track data and coordinate information for their EPIC um, EHR. And, um, Another person was asking about support for um, developing policies and procedures. And so first I'd just like to do a quick plug for the Patient Center Primary Care Institute. We have some resources on there and links to some of our partners who have additional resources on these topics. But I'd like to put it um, to Marcel and the group for any additional resources or trainings that you know about. Do you want to speak to the training that you're doing and how, what maybe tools you're using for that training? Um, so the um, the tools that I've been using are are some of just my own created um, policies and procedures uh, that I've used, and I can certainly make those available. Um, I I will um, be in touch with Rebecca after this um, to to maybe put some of those resources up for you guys. Um, the other thing. Um, there's in the panel management, the resources um, guide. Um, I'm trying to see which one was one of the ones that I used. Um, the UCSF Center for Excellence in Primary Care down at the bottom of panel management, they, there's some great tools on their website um, for panel management that I've used before. Um, let's see. You can also, um, my contact information, it should be on here. Um, you can also just email me directly any specific questions that you have, um, and maybe I can um, better guide you uh, to, to something that may help you in your clinic specifically. Sorry, I'm not, I don't have anything right in front of me right now. Thank you, Emma. I think, I think that's... Um, that's just fine. There's all, there are a lot of different resources, and um, and it can be hard to find them. And I think you're right. It, it just depends on specifically what people are looking for. So um, so I put the email address up here. One other question we had was um, somebody was wondering whether or not you recommend having panel management staff working non-traditional hours so they could better reach members oh. or patients. As a panel coordinator, it just depends on your demographic. I know specifically, if I'm calling patients' parents, it's better to call those people either first thing in the morning or later in the afternoon because they're at work during the day taking care of things that they need to take care of, and majority of people are. But as for like our Medicare patients, sometimes it's easier to get a hold of them during the day because they're at home. They are retired for a lot of them, or if they have disabilities and different things that qualify them for Medicare and also our Medicaid patients, it just depends on the demographic that you're using. And it also just depends on your clinic hours as well, because if your clinic is running only an eight to five clinic, then calling people outside of that time really isn't going to help because you aren't, it's not going to help as much. It will help, but it won't help as much because you don't have the provider or the RN or the traditional staff that's regularly there during the regular normal hours to back you up or to help if there's a triage call or something that comes in while you're doing that outreach. So it just depends on the clinic and depends on the demographic of patients that you're dealing with. Okay, thank you, Roche. Um, and looking at the time, I, again, I want to respect everyone's time, and I promise that we'd be out of here um, right at 11. So any additional questions, I think please feel free to field them to any of our wonderful speakers and presenters today. Email address is here. You could also feel free to email um, info at pcpci.org, or if you're a part of Health Insights, um, 
CMS tests. You can email your state leads, your project leads. And I just wanted to say, again, one more thank you very much to our presenters for um, sharing your experiences and your expertise and um, putting together this wonderful presentation. I think uh, it's been really helpful, and I, I hope it's been very helpful for the audience. And I, also a thank you to the audience for bearing with us for an hour and a half. There's a lot of information we've sifted through. We're going to post more resources on our website um, along with the recording and the slides. And for the QIO um, Health Insight folks and Acumenture Health, the next webinar for this series will be on um, quality reporting and health information technology on Thursday, April 21st, so 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Pacific time or 12 to 1 General Mountain time. And please do take a few moments to complete the post-webinar survey, especially if you are requesting CME or CEU credits. We'll copy the link into the um, chat box now. But otherwise, again, thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.